it sounded exactly on to me, which is interesting. Yeah, I think because uh, I'm leading it and you're hearing it, so you're just hearing the count and then you clap when I clap. But I do the count and clap, and then there's a delay, and then you clap. <laughs> anyway, uh, so... Um, <laughs> here we are once again one thing we never forget how to do and that's dawdle an entry in that we're like what I don't know how to do this even no. though we're old hat by now I know I should probably start editing these chunks out and just be like right to the chase do Get it the information they came for all right well hold on I actually shit I don't have a I don't have a little middle name thing yeah, me don't neither. That, I don't even know if I'm on. I'm just gonna have to make it up. Yeah. Look around. I'm gonna look around. Okay. All right. So I've got a bunch of books. You know, I've got the. What are they called? The. Damn it. Anyway, I I must be going senile or just having an early onset Alzheimer's or something. If you think about it, isn't every book a text book? Sounds like some kind of Mitch Hedberg <laughs> joke. Oh, that is a very Mitch Hedberg kind of joke. I am oh, Harland well, that... Every Irrelevance Grant. Oh, and I'm Ryan Quaternary Environments McKenna. <laughs> and this is the Toddler's Philosophy Podcast. Lungs. What are we, what are we <laughs> talking about? Are we, are we going to talk about something? Is that why we're here? Yes. We're going to talk about the origin and evolution of religion. religion. Oh. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. You... But I thought, I thought God is dead or whatever. Thank you. Good. You pull them all out. All the references, okay? Uh, Are we going to be breaking the spell tonight? <laughs> it's the end of faith, everyone. God is not great. No, it's a delusion. Not at all. It's a delusion. No, oh, I need the horses. I need horses trotting, right? Clop, 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 clop. Now we're not going to talk about the um, the I hate religion topic. That, I mean, you can hate on religion if you want. I, I don't have any of. I just don't have hate for religion. I'm not saying I'm like welcome into my life or whatever. But I just it's an indifference, I suppose. Well, indifference to religion. That's nice, I guess. Refreshing. Different. Indifference. <laughs> All right. Um. <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, so yeah, not the metaphysics of not the you know, but the you say the origin and evolution of religion as a human cultural institution or something like that. Well, I mean, yeah, if we're going to talk about it being you know, the evolution of it, then I think we kind of need to talk about it not as an institution per se, but as something more evolutionarily relevant, like 
oh, I don't know, we, phenotypes or traits, you know, that kind of stuff. And so um, that's kind of, I think, where um, we get, we could get ourselves into trouble if we don't, you know, kind of keep on track in that. Can't way. we get in trouble tonight? Ooh. Not at all, sir. Not at all. Okay, so important. you want to say institutions don't evolve or they're not the... No, they can evolve. It's just, you know, when we're going to talk about evolution, we, 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 we want to use the, the words that we use to talk about evolution, you know? So institution is just a way of talking about uh, some kind of structure or whatever. But in particular, we want to talk about, you know, well, what is it? what is an institution relative to what, you know, like, uh, and what is that thing that it's relative to or relevant to? And, uh, that thing, how can we talk about that thing in terms of evolution? Got it. <laughs> cool. So yeah. What is, what would be the first step or what do you mean? Well, in particular, you know, um, the, one of the things that, want to talk i guess we could kind of walk it back but i mean you know what is religion you know and then you know is it framed within something else you know like i'll throw a definition out to you if you would like i love it um, definitions are some of my favorite things yes they are uh so here's one definition it's sort of wikipedia ish um religion is a cultural system with certain behaviors and practices that relate humanity to the supernatural, transcendental, or spiritual. So then, given that's a definition, and you go, okay, well, well then, obviously, then religion is a cultural thing, right? It's not a, it's not a thing that, uh, you know, cardinals don't have. Well, fuck. Not cardinals, Ryan. God damn it. Black cap chickadees don't have religion, right? I mean, do they even have culture? You know, that kind of thing. Like, So we want to talk about, like, well, what is it, you know, re you know relative to or... Anyway. Know what I mean? Yeah. The only thing... The, the first thing that makes me hesitate about this definition is the word relate. And I don't know what that brings along for you but if if you're saying we're relating humanity to the supernatural does that mean there has to be such a thing as the supernatural and this is the way the method of relationship but what if there just is nothing there i don't know if this you know begs the question against ear religion like religion to me it's you know behaviors and practices right it's it's mm -hmm. so it's that thing that connects people to something that's not the usual to, natural like you know what i mean like to stories that uh, include supernatural elements yeah i suppose but it, it, it you can be inside it you can be outside it the definition could still just be what it is you know still a religion it's a it's a it's a you know set of behaviors and practices that relate, maybe you could say humanity to the stories of supernatural or whatever, but yeah. that's kind of like, well, wouldn't the stories already include that connection, right? The stories are going to naturally include a connection between humanity. And so it's like, well, then it's a, you know, so they connect humanity to the connection that humanity has with supernatural, like the stories that we tell about. And it just, it just connects humanity to the supernatural. Supernatural can be a thing, whether it not there is anything supernatural. It's still a thing that we have constructed, right? Like a concept or whatever. It doesn't even have to have a story behind it. It just, boom, like there's an omnipresent, omnipotent thing that controls everything. And then, you know, it's not natural. It's more than that. It's beyond that. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like you can just say it. It doesn't have to have a backstory. It doesn't have to have a future. You know what I'm saying? And then you can start to tell a story about, and that's the connection, I guess, between humanity and the thing, the supernatural or whatever. And religion would be those customs that are, you know, put in place that people, uh, you know, practice around that, that story, that narrative, that whatever. 
am I saying everything and you're like, God damn it, I said that or what the hell? Well, we I think in the interest of making progress, we shouldn't get too much more hung up on it. I just want I'm pretty sure this is what you think, just to make it clear. You're not assuming that there are any real existent quote unquote supernatural entities or events or anything. It's just that religion is being defined as a cultural system, the set of behaviors and practices somehow oriented around the supernatural, should it be there or not. You know, it, we're not assuming that there is anything supernatural, right? Correct. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not assuming there isn't because I could always then say, well, the supernatural is this social construct or whatever that we have created, yep. you know, it's agnostic about the supernatural. Definitely. Yep. And so, uh, so there's that. And then, well, clearly then we're saying in that definition, at least that it's, it's a cultural thing. It's something yep. has to do with culture. What the fuck is culture? You know? And so, Here's another one for you, and as sort of Wikipedia-ish, dictionary-ish, and I just say, uh, I'm summarizing, the customs, beliefs, stylings, art, institutions, etc., of a group of people. I like them apples. Um, it's deliciously vague, but I think it's probably good enough to get what we need to what we need out of it, and if not, we can refine it as we go. But that sounds like a fair general list style, you know, cultures, all that stuff. You put it all together. What? Do, how do people dress, and what do people build, and what do people, what does their art look like, and what do they believe, and what language do they speak, and what, you know, if you just take all this and wrap it all up together, you might be able to say that is the culture of some given what population or i don't know i just to be vague group, yeah. <laughs> group. <laughs> just like funk you know like so sometimes talk about subcultures and stuff like that yep all right so, so yeah, that sounds okay. fine and then religion is a sub part it's a piece of the culture and then which piece well it's the one where they talk about the supernatural shit <laughs> yeah, basically okay and our connection to it if there is any mm-hmm so that is essentially so then the then the main topic is is that the origin like when where did it begin how did it begin and the the evolution of that like how does it change you know or you know if it does at all and 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 why and whatever um and so when we talk about it in those terms i think there's a number of things that we kind of need to consider uh that are helpful to, you know, talk about how they change and, or how they might arise in the first place. So, um, so I've got, I got some hypotheses. Some of them are going to talk about origins or going to, at least we can maybe identify that they're kind of keying in on origins. And then some might not, some might be more just sort of hypotheses about the evolution of religion or something or its purpose or its uh, value, et cetera. Okay. Um, and then in order to kind of maybe better understand some of these hypotheses, uh, I was thinking we could just be able to ask some questions to be able to maybe get clarity because some of it's going to be clarification from the fact that I was the one trying to distill this information down and so maybe i missed a few things but also if i got some of the core elements of some of these hypotheses then we can ask questions like are they really addressing it you know based on ryan's interpretation of the idea is this really what they you know have they completed the the, the project is there are there things missing in this hypothesis type of stuff uh-huh based upon this more formalized way uh, a formal and informal way of asking questions of any kind of, um, you know, evolutionary domain or domain that has presumably an evolutionary component. So I have myself just a bunch of like kind of questions or whatever, but then also um, I have uh, this set 
This is a little more organized way of asking evolutionary questions, which were created by this guy, Nico Tinbergen. He was uh, Richard Dawkins' um, advisor or, you know, mentor, if you will. And he has these sort of these four questions that it's called, but really it's kind of just this matrix of, you know, I love to do this kind of stuff where you've got a couple different, uh, you know, ways of thinking about things. And then you've got a couple other ones, they relate to each other. And then you kind of see where they intersect, you know? Um, uh, anyway, you know, you know, I love those things and I have, I have this, for those listening, I have a little PDF thing that I sent to Harlan so he can look at this image with me, but you can't unless somehow it gets included, but you can look it up. Tin Virgin's four questions, Google it. You'll find some of these, uh, figures, if you will, or tables, matrices, whatever. Um, and so I kind of want to go into some of these, um, hypotheses, but then at the same time, be able to talk about the question. So now I'm feeling like there's a, oh, I should probably just kind of quickly go over some of the questions and then we can re go over the questions later while we're doing stuff. And these questions are just in, in general, anytime you want to talk about the evolution of X, these are evolutionary questions that you ought to be able to ask about the domain in question is that right yeah so let's let's just go right into tin virgins stuff um how it's kind of organized people organize it various in various ways so i just have a random ass one here and um they've got this one um i guess you could say axis which is sort of like two you've got two objects of explanation as it's called and one is sort of this developmental slash historical object if you will or a way of explaining things and another one sort of they call it like single form but it's like the trait at one slice in time and then uh and the other one's more about a sequence of you know that results in a particular trait and then in, then there's two kinds of explanations and the two kinds of explanations are one is called proximate which explains how organisms work by describing their mechanisms and their uh, the development throughout their life, also known as onto ontogeny, not ontology. And then there's the ultimate. Um, and in this one I have, it just says evolutionary. I don't know why. Uh, but it explains how a species came to its current form by describing a sequence of forms. You could also say instead of species, it's a group of organisms or whatever. How they come to their current form by describing a sequence of forms and how they were influenced by, say, selection and other evolutionary factors, hand waving at the end there. But uh, so in particular, then we have this, this grouping of four, and then there's these questions and sort of, uh, yeah. So where the proximate and the developmental historical the intersect, we have ontogeny. And then where the sort of ultimate and developmental historical intersect, we have phylogeny. And then where the proximate and sort of, they call it the single form or whatever, intersect, we have mechanism. And then finally we have, uh, under the ultimate and single form, we have adaptive significance. So under ontogeny, the question is, how does the trait develop in individuals? You know, like, how do you get it over time, you know, within the lifetime of an organism, let's say. In the the... The next one over uh, between this intersection between this sort of single form and the proximate explanation, we have a mechanism, uh, air, you know, domain. And it, there the question is, well, what is the structure of the trait? Like, how does it work? You know, how does it function? Like, what is it? You know, what's it, the whole point? And then finally, or not finally, but then we have sort of this ultimate kind of developmental historical intersection and that's kind of the phylogeny, and that's sort of asking what is the the evolutionary history of this particular trait. So it's just a mo across generations, you know, across replications, right? And then finally, finally, the we talk about adaptive significance, and that one's asking, you know, how have variations in the trait interacted with environments to influence 
fitness. What's fitness? In ways that help to explain the traits form or whatever function. So um, I think the big one for us is going to be because for many of these hypotheses, they're, they're considered adaptive, you know, in their um, approach. They're, they're trying to say there's an adaptation. Religion has an adaptive quality or whatever. That's the real one. I think we want to be asking about a lot of these. Yeah, is, number four, right? Number four, yeah. yeah. Adaptive significance. How have variations in this particular, how, in religion or whatever the fuck, mm -hmm. interacted with environments to influence fitness, which I'll quickly just throw out there, which is just the degree of reproductive success, we'll say, is a brief, brief definition of fitness. How have they influenced the, re the degree of reproductive success in ways that help explain its form, its, you know, its ubiquity, all that kind of stuff. All right. That makes sense so to me that, that, that that's the question that we'll primarily concentrate on yeah. when talking about religions and the way that, that you know, uh, that they've changed. That doesn't really exactly. address the origin thing. That's kind of separate, right? Right. It's a little separate. But one of the things about origins is that we can ask about the hypo a given hypothesis is, you know, is it about, a relig you know, religions origins spread maintenance or some of each of these you know because that's kind of the thing about a quote-unquote trait is that there's it it arises it's like it has its um its source of origin or whatever there it is and then it has to kind of spread it has to go around and be become more prevalent and then it has to be maintained you know it has to be you know continue to be relevant or whatever and it could be some of these hypotheses have all three or just two or whatever. So there. There you have it. All right. How are you feeling? I hope everybody was taking notes. No. I know. I, I you know that that last the Tim Virgin's four questions, I I'm sorry to the audience if that got a little chunky, but whatever. Um anyway, um Quickly, I want to just, you know, a, a trait uh, as a definition is like, you know, a feature of an organism or a feature in a group of organisms. And it could be morphological, it could be physiological, it could be behavioral, it could be life historical, you know, uh, meaning like, uh, when do you reproduce? How fucking long does it take you to get to maturity? Uh, how many offspring do you produce? Like all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's life history in terms of uh, biology. All right. So now is it, is it time to go into these fucking hypotheses? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, people. So there's people have thought about this and they kind of have some ideas about, um, you know, just about, you know, whatever the, the questions are that, one might have about religion when they say, well, why religion or whatever. Um, and so when I read and I'm, you know, it's, I read a lot and then it's like things get mixed up and I have a hard time like going, I'm like, when did I, I don't take really good notes about the things that I read, which is fine. Cause whatever, it's not how I work. But sometimes I'm like, did I read that in this book or this book or do I even own the book anymore? It's like that kind of thing. But, uh, Darwin's cathedral is a relatively recent book by David Sloan Wilson, who is an evolutionary biologist. And he is sort of the, you know, the, father of multi-level selection theory we talked about that with a discussion that um oh, got an alarm going off for my son he better be going to bed anyway um and he uh you know he talks about hypotheses as well and he he kind of breaks them up into adaptive and non-adaptive just as a side note anytime any of these fucking people talk about you know, adaptive and non-adaptive, I always hear it, whether they want me to or not, that they're like, adaptive! And then they go, oh, non-adaptive, because that's no fun. You know, like, they just, I totally get that from them. They're just like, yay, adaptation! Which I'm not saying is, a like, a terrible thing. I, I like it, too, but I just always notice that. I'm like, anyway. How postmodern of you. 
to mm-hmm. hear that you know when they make the dichotomy, one is always privileged over the other. For sure, I feel like that is very postmodern of me. Good pointing it out. Anyway, okay. So let's begin. There's no real order to these. I wish there was a. I did a beautiful job with it or whatever, but I didn't. So we're just gonna go into it. So the first adaptive hypothesis, it's I think in this category. So we can start asking questions now. Um, is one that I'm just calling uh, the watcher. You know, um, the watcher hypothesis. So. The empirical record suggests that our primate ancestors were not egalitarian, you know, the biggest gorilla won, you know, and dominated. But those primate ancestors, their hunter-gatherer descendants were rather egalitarian, meaning um, each, you know, person in the small little hunter-gatherer group uh, kind of watched each other they they were you know holding each other accountable in small groups so no one took too much or whatever however in kind of these post agricultural kind of archaic states things then again were very unequal you know like the america had... <laughs> are we a post agricultural archaic state yes nice. <laughs> Can we include like other parts of the West, like the United Kingdom? They're fucking disheveled. Anyway. Um, so, and fucking Australia, Jesus Christ. Um, so, you know, there's a big kahuna in the, those archaic states, right? But finally, in our golden age of modern times, with constitutional democracies, things become more equal. And this is what's, I'm bringing this poor bastard in again, Peter Turchin. You know, he dubbed it the Z curve, where you're kind of going back and forth between, you know, uh, you know, egalit- more and less egalitarian living. So the hypothesis is that essentially that once large complex societies developed, there was a greater need for a quote-unquote watcher to keep people in line since not all the activities and defectors could be tracked because you're just a ton of people. So the the idea that quote unquote big gods supply the kind of the judgment necessary to force people to at a minimum not be bad, you know, like the Google mantra, don't be evil. So this idea of a big shared narrative helps hold a big society together. So it operates on a really large high level. So, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town. It's easy when you're sleeping, you know, God and your dead grandparents are watching you masturbate. (laughs) Anyway, um, I do want to quickly note, though, that right now, as we speak, there are people who are against each other in this disagreement about whether or not it is uh, that big societies need big gods or if big gods actually happened first and that just somehow facilitated big societies so far the data supports the former and i will say really quickly that if you have a big gods thing facilitating big societies that would actually kind of be a i think a non-adaptive hypothesis but let's ask questions of this one if you want so what i'm hearing this one is saying is the boiled down basic idea is we have for non-ideological reasons for we we develop very complex societies we get we got ourselves into this situation where there's a relative equality amongst the members but then during the day they're all just out doing whatever they do it would be really easy for that to get out of hand so perhaps a sort of what you're calling a quote-unquote big gods religion might have originated in this situation or would be well suited to it or something because its presence might be a cheap, efficient regulating factor on the behavior of all these more or less free agents that are out there running around. 
our society would fall apart if it weren't for someone watching over and telling you what to do and, you know, be a good citizen and do the right thing. And, well, who says? There's no, we can't afford a centurion force strong enough to actually crack the whip on everybody. So we move it up into the sky and say, oh, yeah, the punishments and rewards are coming down from on high from someone more powerful than you could ever imagine. Exactly. And I, and I do think that, um, and I don't know how to rope this in, but I do wonder if, like, you know, neat, I'm not a Nietzschean scholar or anything like that, but the idea of God is dead, I mean, that seems to be a big turning point then if this hypothesis was correct about the the sequence of how it came to be you know that there was more and more people came together and then they, we needed some kind of way of holding everything together or it would all fall apart we got big gods big gods is actually a um there's an actual book i think called big gods so it's it's, it's an actual term so it's i think as opposed to like um you know, uh, the spirit of the hill, the spirit of the river, you know, or just the random ass, you know, mischievous spirit who like makes, gives you bad luck or whatever, you know, like big gods are like, you know, um, you know, omnipresent style, you know, old man in a white beard. Yeah. That, you know, that, that's, you know, not little gods or whatever, you know. I think there could be a sort of existentialist Sartrean response to the Nietzschean God is dead thing where it's like, now I am totally responsible. I am cursed with freedom because there's no <laughs> one now to tell me what to do. So I have this right. cru perhaps crushing responsibility to figure out, well, now, what, how am I going to act now that I've realized there's no big man in the sky telling me? Exactly. Um, and so I guess in some ways that one being an origins explanation, maybe it helps us understand more. It, I don't know what the um, the adaptive significance is here other than, you know, being in big societies, cre there's a problem, right? But what's the environmental context? Is it just like we, I have the hardest time like – it's one thing when it's easier to think of evolution in terms of just organisms as whole entities, individuals, and oh, they got this pimple that forms on their head and it just so happens to help them when, I don't know, the lava comes raining down out of the volcano, which happens often enough and shit, it, you know, if it doesn't help them survive and reproduce, you know, and those having that pimple on their head can live in that volcanic environment. How does this or any of the other ones we have? that we're going to talk about do that <laughs> like and 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 when it's cultural it's harder it's like you really like for me anyway i gotta get my brain up to some other level i'm just not sure maybe we're it doing do what? it wrong like what's the adaptive significance you know what i mean can we even ask a question of this last hypothesis with respect to can we ask the question how have variations in the trade of you know religion or whatever interacted with environments to influence fitness and blah it's just kind of like i don't know I don't know, like, um, that's like, it's such a high up kind of state that the hypothesis is trying to address, or high level anyway, that I'm not sure, like, it seems easier to talk about some of these kind of questions when it comes to just an organism. Anyway. Can't you just do a thing where you put two different civilizations on two little islands and stipulate that they are culturally identical but for one has a big god's religion in it and the other doesn't maybe it has some sort of primitive fairy type religion maybe it is purely atheistic materialist and then just watch it play out and then say oh well look at here in the big god's one their society maintained and slowly began to flourish because there were very few cheaters and what you know whatever the okay well okay stop 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 yeah. right there that's that's selection that doesn't necessarily mean it's adaptive though like that i could see between two different groups i could say, okay yeah one is selected over another 
right? Because the other one can't hold itself together. It doesn't have big gods or whatever. And this one does have big gods and it holds itself together pretty well. But to what? You know, like what is it up against other than itself? Okay. That sort of looping so don't back think about... on itself. So we've got that anyway, the idea of the two cultures or the two populations of humans on two different islands and they have their culturally identical but for their religious differences. Then maybe this is what you're looking for. The organism in question is the religious text or even just a, you know, a paragraph or a sentence. And it can have the trait well, let's say okay, we've got two different sentences, two different organisms that are describing the nature of God. And one of them says, they both agree, well, God is omniscient. He knows everything that you do and he watches you while you masturbate. Um, so that's like, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, the two organisms both have eyeballs or both have legs or whatever. And they both have omniscience and omnipotence or whatever, but... Now we'll have one trait vary but on the God description on the two islands. And one of them, he's like a super judgmental, moralistic prude who's really going to send a lot of people to hell and there's a lot of threat. The fire and brimstone one. And the other one, yeah, he's omniscient and omnipotent, but he's also just a totally easygoing, easy-go-lucky God that's like, yeah, whatever. I know what you did last summer, but I don't care. It's fine. You can all do what you want. <laughs> Does that, like, though, that would be the two, di one organism has a, a trait of judgmentalness and one doesn't. And then you can see which one of those is more successful at replicating amongst the minds of the different humans on the island or whatever. I guess in this case, we're looking at one human group, right, and seeing which religion Sir, which one replicates and reproduces, and you know, which one is more fit given this group of humanity, right? Yes, but what is the connection to the what's the environment that it is better fit to? The data, the the culture defined as you defined it up here. You know the okay, customs see. and beliefs and institutions and stuff of this group. So it's just what this group of people does all day and all year. That's so the, the culture is the environment that the yes. text is attempting to reproduce in. Do, do you know? It do, is someone motivated to print off another thousand copies and try to hand them out at their church or sell them on the street corner or whatever? <laughs> I'm like, we haven't gotten to that hypothesis yet, Harley. <laughs> but yeah, no. So the religion is. <clears throat> as a thing <laughs> as a cultural as a system um so yeah it's like okay it's so the, look at just, it as, it's the marketplace of ideas thing right and how many people buy it well i don't buy that i buy this one you know and so success in the marketplace of ideas being adopted and repeated by the humans in the culture in their day-to-day -day activities with one another is the environment of selection of the religion. But that environment of selection is the culture. Yeah. Okay. Because that's, that's kind of good. I think that would be then key, right? So you got this hypothesis about big gods and big societies and that you end up getting these large societies. You have this culture and then there's this, now we have to kind of move back to, I hate to do this, but we have to move into some other areas. Cause I just, it's going to be more useful. You kept kind of like saying things and I was like, Oh, we just need to say the word so that we don't have to worry about it anymore. Make things brief. We want to just, you and I are both proponents of the word meme, you know um, I'm doing it just because no one's provided anything else. <laughs> They just haven't. They don't. There are people that don't like it, but they don't really go into it or they don't say it at all. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And then from meme, we can do this whole thing called memeplex. And I'm like, yay! <laughs> it's just like it. It's helpful. That's what I want. I want to be able to, um, you know, in the in a Harlandonian way, I want to I want to do my projects or whatever. And this helps me do that, right? Sure. So let's define. Let I don't know where you want. I mean, we're just pausing on the match. Uh, between religion and culture, culture being the selective environment for something 
like religion, which is some type of system within that. Now, we want to say religion is, we're not going to say religion is a meme necessarily, right? I think we want to jump up and say it's a meme plex, but we haven't even defined what a meme is or a meme plex for that fucking matter. So I think we should do that. Sure. Past conversations you and I have had, you've not been super satisfied with uh, Dawkins' initial definition of a meme or whatever, um, if I'm recalling correctly. But I'm still just going to throw it out there. I'm going to throw both of them out there, and then we can talk about that. And then maybe we can move on once we're satisfied to go back to the matchup between religion and culture and all that kind of shit. Okay. Me. A unit of cultural transmission. Meme flex. A stable set of mutually assisting memes. Okay, let's talk about that. That's fine. Let's just use that for tonight, I think. I mean, I don't okay. want to get into into debating the definition of memes for this meeting. Cool. So the unit of cultural replication might be, you know, Jesus wept or something, right? A small verse. Mm -hmm. something that you know you could say and oh that's catchy i remember it and then you can say it to someone the next day and then the meme plex might be something like the entire king james bible or even you know there could be different sizes it could be the entire catholicism itself could be a meme plex right yeah a mutually assisting and reinforcing set of things that you could actually just say or read or print on your t-shirt saying whatever Yep. Okay, so then religion, I would say then is, you know, uh, instead of saying system, let's say, let's say it's a stable set of mutually assisting memes that is found itself through the increasing size of societies or whatever as being a really good way to, well, it found itself surviving and uh and adapting and adjusting and changing over time to this selective environment we call culture yep great so In, then i could we say analogously to like could we say re religion is the same size as economy perhaps and if yeah, sure. religion is defined as the way the culture interacts with the supernatural, the economy is the way the culture interacts with exchange. And then there can be lots of different economic systems, lots of different religious systems. They can compete and they might have a good time given other cultural aspects and they're going to fight with each other and interact with each other and blah, blah, blah. Right? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But it had an origin. Potentially that hypothesis is one way to look at it. Um, and then it has spread. And um, additionally, it has, uh, you know, been maintained because religion's still around today, even though God is dead. All right. Are we good with the watcher? You want to move on to the other ones? I think that one makes sense. Okay. Here's another one. And I don't know if this one makes sense or not. This is, again, my interpretation. Um, I call this one the organism hypothesis. So this is a David Sloan Wilson, multi-level selection guy thing. Considering groups behaving as organisms like an ant colony or some collective-based villain in a kid's cartoon. I see that a lot because I've got kids. Religion is the... I don't know what a collective-based villain is. It's like when a whole bunch of fish come together and create some kind of like monster thing that then fights the good guys. Oh, sure. You like uh, in Nightmare Before Christmas or whatever, that guy that's like a bag of worms yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Thank um, you. Kids cartoon. <laughs> that's often done in kids cartoons, huh? That's an in itself interesting thing to notice <laughs> to me as a as how deep the propaganda really is. All right. Oh yeah. No, I see it all the time. It's in in very different kinds of cartoons. It's almost like a, uh, I think it's a trope or, or it's like a a thing you can reach in if you're like, oh, who's going to be our villain this week? You know, like oh, like maybe well, it seems collective. obviously like a Cold War communism thing, right? Oh, the hero yeah. is this single sure, individual yes. pursuing their, and the villain is this collective. And oh, okay. Anyway, Gary. <laughs> No, that's perfect. Yes, exactly. That is that is it. I didn't see it for that, but 
Yes. Okay. So, considering groups behaving as organisms, like an ant colony, at least, <laughs> we think about that or something like that. Uh, religion is the coordinated action of individuals for the good of the group that act as an ad adaptive unit. I don't know what that means. I looked hard, high and low. People say adaptive unit a lot, and I'm like, what does it mean? They're like, anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, ah, but this is, I'm trying here. So, coordinated action of individuals for the good of the group that act as an adaptive unit whose behavior within the group is regulated by a moral system. Moral system being a social group with rules, permissions, and a means to litigate violations. Uh, a violation, here's an example of like a coordinated action of individuals, all the cells in your body, a violation of the rules governing the multicellular action of all these cells in your body. It would be like cancer or something, I suppose. Um, anyway. So there's that, uh, that one. How do you, anything... Is this sort of saying if we take the two islands, the island that has organism religion is going to outcompete the atheist island because, I don't know, for example, they've got really good charities and the... Uh, so their homeless population is well taken care of and given a whole bunch of soup and uh, yeah and because of that then they develop this Einstein who otherwise would have died of starvation in the selfish atheist society but because we have this moral religious system that values taking care of all the members of our society we simply have more members and therefore we you know develop space travel first and we win or what it, something like that yes and i really like this two islands experimental yeah. setup let's keep that going uh -huh. um yes so let's just say yes to that i like that and yeah like these two different organisms say one has this thing called religion the other one doesn't <clears throat> so that doesn't i'm not seeing the origin story yeah so i don't one, know I don't know if there is an origin story in this one. This one is kind of more of like a, almost like a maintenance. Yeah. One, perhaps. A group uh, that does have a significant presence of this style of religion may succeed where a group lacking it fails. Therefore, that would reinforce, it would be, that's why it would be an adaptive feature. Because of the selective environment of the culture that the, that, religion happens to pop up in and versus the the selective environment of a culture where it doesn't you know and it does better more children are born because more people are taken care of more people survive on and on uh and of course the regulating factor there he says is like a moral system you know uh that holds it together so sort of like which of course moment. one could have Without any supernatural aspects, you could have naturalistic mora moralities, but whatever. Yeah, so this one doesn't really go in that supernatural, transcendental, spiritual direction. So that's kind of interesting. They seem correlated historically on Earth the way we've done it. Religion is often in the business of morality. But I've always been really confused by the conflation or necessity claims there. You know, the whole people that are like, well, you can't be good without God and all this stuff. It makes no sense at all to me. Yeah, it doesn't either to me. Jesus. But I do feel like we've kind of, I don't know, this one's sort of a maintenance thing. It's hard to see that religion... There's no real, as far as I could tell, and maybe I need to go back over it again, but there's no, none of that supernatural, other than maybe that's the way to reinforce a moral system, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to the big gods thing, you know, people are, are moral because, you know, they want to make it into the afterlife or something. And that's a nice way to kind of force them. That's the, the carry a big stick kind of way. But yeah. that I don't recall being necessarily said. That doesn't mean to say it wasn't written. Um, okay, so moving on or yep. 
Okay, the next one I'm calling the parasite yeah. hypothesis, which I think a lot of people call this one that, or they call it the mind virus one, which is uh, from an article by Dawkins back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and if I am correct in this, I think you are a lot more familiar with this one than I am. But memes are like viruses propagating themselves on strands of DNA, except they do it within minds. Religion is a major memeplex that regenerates itself in large groups of people, and it is essentially the memes that are trying to adapt in this way to the mind. You know, the they're trying to find ways to, I don't know, uh, enjoy more time uh, uh, living or whatever. I could see the selection component here. I'm still actually, to be honest with you, trying to figure out the adaptive thing. And you need to fill in more of the blanks here if you can, or if you care to. Yeah. This one sounds to me like a lot of what Dennett talks about, because he's done a bunch of work on religion, or had, maybe uh, 15 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he often uses, well, he says that he's asked this question all the time. Religion is very, very successful and popular on Earth, but you're an atheist, Dan. What's the deal? Why does everyone else believe, but you're so clever you can see? It's got to be good for something. You're this evolutionary guy, and religion is everywhere, so religion must be good. What is it good for? And he says, well, that's just a very basic error. It doesn't have to be good for humanity or for me or you or any individual. And he uses the analogy with the common cold. Well, what's the cold good for as far as we are concerned? It seems mm -hmm. pretty inconvenient and to us, but that isn't what matters. That's not how it works. It simply happens to replicate really well in human immune systems or whatever, in human populations, given our immune systems. And maybe religions are like that. They're just given other facts about how human brains work, human languages work, human cultures tend to work. Religious ideas are simply really, really good at replicating themselves in that environment. And he gives out a few examples like, well, we're the only animal we know of that is aware that they're going to die. That's a pretty big deal. That can have lots and lots of effects. And maybe in an animal that knows it's going to die, supernatural stories about the afterlife would be important. So that would tend to replicate. Doesn't mean it's good for you. It just means that given facts about you, it will probably have... It'll have a lot of impact and you'll want to repeat it stories that are simply out of the ordinary and unique are very memorable and you'll want to repeat them when someone goes off in the forest and comes back and reports that they ran into a jabberwocky out there that might be something that you will want to tell uh, the way that it works up here in northern minnesota is we've got all these myths about the presence of cougars because they're <laughs> rare, but not z zero, and they matter because they potentially will eat chattel or children or you. So we really care about them, and there's all these things. Oh, this guy got one on a trail cam, and oh, this person saw a track here, and and it'll just <laughs> spread through the gossip web immediately if there ever is a potential cougar sighting. Maybe gods are like that. There's just any weird, unexplainable thing that happens. You can tell a story about it and that'll replicate. Whatever. The basic point is the meme plex or, and the memes that it's made up of don't have to have, of course, truth behind them or even benefit to the cultures that they are replicating within. They simply work. They just like a virus given the nature of the makeup they reproduce and that's all you know basically all there is to it right does that help or make sense that helps and makes sense i do want to expand on it though because trying to tie it back in like i get what the you know the mechanism is i get now how it works 
you know, I get sort of how it can develop in a group of people or what have you. And then, um, you know, but I'm, I'm starting to think about like, well, maybe then, maybe it's a parasite, but it's a parasite, something that, you know, is kind of harmful, you know, but in some senses, I wonder if it also could be kind of a, in some, you know, environments, selective environments, it could be a, like a co-evolution or, you know, a mutualism. Yeah, they could be, yeah, it could be a mutualism. It could, it could Where, I mean, again, yeah. I think we'd be agnostic about that, right? Whether it's good or bad, it just simply replicates well. Another example, I think it came from Dennett or something that I listened to recently. They said, what if religions are like squirrels or rats or crows? These species that they're wild animals. They're not domesticated by us, but they live near us and th and rely upon our practices a lot, right? The rats yeah. are eating the garbage and the... Right. So yeah. maybe it's something along those lines. You know, it's not, squirrels aren't necessarily good or bad. It's just that they're around. <laughs> and maybe that's right. what religions are like. They're just around and they hang around and they do really well around the way we function right now. Yeah, maybe like right now, then it is a mutualism in that it provides the cultures that they're in their adaptive significance. Otherwise, it does seem kind of non-adaptive. It would just be, well, fucking squirrels. How are squirrels something that, you know what I mean, for just you and me walking down the street or our families or whatever the fuck, you know, squirrels are just squirrels, you know, like unless, you know, we can gain something out of them, maybe we eat them, but typically not and in the case of something like religions or whatever or even the individual memes or something that are part of them it's hard for me you know what i mean like i'm just trying to get a sense for how they relate uh back to this idea that it would be an adaptive thing so maybe in some ways there's sort of two it's a two pata you know you could have a non-adaptive version and an adaptive version Maybe the adaptive version is more the mutualism thing where it just also just so happens that like you get this, uh, you know, I remember there was a book called, um, uh, what's it called? It was called The Earth Abides and the main character gets bitten by a rattlesnake and for whatever reason, it's that poison in his body that allows him to survive some fucking airborne disease that kills everybody, all these humans. Mm -hmm. And he's then just one, you know, it's like, it's one of those things that just so happens to like be the thing that helps you get through or whatever. And maybe in that sense, the parasite could be a, a mutual, it could become a rapid mutualism that has an adaptive component, or it could just be this thing, this ratty looking thing. <laughs> that's just like, there it is. It doesn't do anything really for us, but it's hanging around or whatever. Um, anyway. And what, what do they say? 90% or something of the cells in your body aren't quote unquote yours or aren't human, but are all the mutualist. Yeah. Yes. Right. Microbiomes and all the other little parasites and carriers on. Um, what yes. percentage of the ideas in your head in some important sense are quote unquote yours that you actually developed independently or thought of or something versus just that which has been downloaded into you by your culture and so that right. religion would just be one segment of that that you receive and then it can just potentially if not examined or ferreted out by some other factors it could just go on living in you yeah absolutely yeah um, what's funny is that when you were talking, you kind of touched on or kind of grazed by the next two ones that I have in a way. Okay. Um, so the next one is, uh, the useful fiction hypothesis. Um, so I, you know, literally false metaphorically true is the bumper sticker or meme that Brett Weinstein uses. So like, though not factual, just go with the words, though not factual, a belief in a higher power or whatever may still be useful if it provides individuals espousing it with increased survival and reproductive success. So I think we kind of were talking about that just a minute ago in a way. I don't know about all the details 
of his particular approach, but that's generally the gist that I gather. And, um, and I guess in that sense, so long as then religions are this major meme plex that increase survival and reproductive success in their ability to match up with, you know, the selective environment of the culture that they're finding themselves in, then, you know, that's adaptive. Um, yeah, I mean, but he doesn't, this one in particular doesn't really say anything adaptive. So that's kind of interesting, but uh, you have to kind of fill in the blanks, I feel like. Well, like I just did. the way that I hear it, though, like you say, I have to get over all of the words because I <laughs> get chimpy about almost everything about the way it's phrased. But I think I understand and probably agree with the underlying idea that perhaps there are relevant behavioral correlates between having religious, quote-unquote, religious beliefs and doing shit that makes you survive and reproduce as an animal. Right. That's how I hear this one as the point, right? You know, and again, fiction, that kind of assumes that it's false rather than staying agnostic like we were trying to do, but just the useful function of maybe if you walk around with certain religious memeplexes installed in your brain, you will tend to survive and reproduce better than someone who doesn't. And if so, that would tend to propagate whatever, something close to a version of the religion that you adopt. Right? Yeah, and you, I was thinking, yeah. You might, you might influence others. You'd be like, oh, man, that person's doing really good. What are they doing? And you like, oh, man, tell me, what's your secret? And they're like, ah, I have Jesus or whatever. And then you say, oh. Right. right. So I'm kind of thinking the useful fiction is kind of like the animal thing, like you were saying. It's also very much like those um, those beetles in Australia that, you know, when people are throwing their brown beer bottles out, they just, you know, that's kind of the same, the, the, the brown, glossy kind of, thing is sort of similar to the wing casings of the female of that particular lineage or whatever and so they're drawn to the beer bottles um but then of course they're trying to mate with something that they cannot inseminate um you know that will produce any offspring and and also there's some crazy ants that are like eat them or whatever while they're running to the beer bottles um and so that also is a thing where it's like, well, is this sort of a, you know, is this something that we just have and it happens to be, it works out really well, like it does for the Beatles without beer bottles in environments, you know, they go, yeah, I see that shiny, glossy brown thing. That's a female. Most of the time that tends to work right, you know, like sort of a useful metric, whether or not it's a good one or whether or not you should continue to do it when you know but the, we just have it in us and we just can't help it and we just keep going in that direction or something um the next one is uh oh anyway about the useful fiction one i still can't see how it's it, what its adaptive significance is other than um you know with respect to say culture if the culture is a selective like i just don't know what the selective environment necessarily always is um because here it's you know it's kind of just a general thing that, you know, higher power beliefs or whatever are useful. I mean, I feel like we've gone into details in other things, but we haven't, you know, this one's just sort of there. I guess we assume the other stuff anyway. Um, but moving on for the sake of moving on, then this next one I call the echo hypothesis, which I think you touched upon as well. So, for instance, some traits may produce spandrels, which we've talked about. I think it was our third episode, episode two, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, so, you know, color red and hemoglobin. Um, it may be that, you know, you know, color, red color produces like a physiological response in seeing blood that is possibly adaptive, like the vasovagal syncope and vertebrates or whatever. And vasovagal syncope leads to fainting in humans partly it seems because we have this upright posture. So similarly, and this is the part that you touched upon talking about the 
when we were talking about the parasite hypothesis, self-awareness is an adaptation potentially that perhaps ha has a byproduct um, in that the fear of one's own death, right? Whatever self-awareness is. Religion then helps allay the fears of, you know, dying or knowing your own death or whatever by convincing people that their minds or souls or whatever are eternal and they'll continue on in an afterlife or something like that. So it's that sort of this echo effect. It's like, you know, just keep, you keep having this ripple or whatever, this, this continuation of the influence of some initial thing that then continues to have effects. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, Again, I'm not sure exactly. This one I kind of feel like is sort of um, adaptive in that it's your, uh, you know, there are adjustments being made to some initial thing. Um, uh, but apparently, the David Sloan Wilson considers it a non adaptive one. I don't know if that's just simply because he saw the thing, the word spandrels or something, and he was like, yeah, then it must be non adaptive. Uh, even though he also talks about it being a secondary adaptation to a byproduct of a primary adaptation. You know, so I don't know. Shut up, Wilson. Jesus Christ. <laughs> all over. So, uh, whatever that, that's another one. And I, I, to be honest with you, some of these, I'm a little more like, anyway, we'll get into that later actually. So just going through these, what's the adaptive significance um, not killing yourself, I guess, <laughs> and like continuing your culture and, uh, you know, making that's an adjustment to a problem that arises potentially. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of it. I have, I'm sure there are other adaptive or other hypotheses that could potentially fall under this category of adaptive, but that's pretty much kind of what I've got. Um, I don't know if you've thought of any other ones that could be potentially adaptive. I am totally uh, ignoring this whole adaptive, non-adaptive distinction and just looking at them as to what extent they explain the origin and evolution of religions. I don't even know what this adaptive, non-adaptive thing means, and I don't care. Do I need to? Um, I'm mostly from the sense that I think that, well, you care only in the sense that I would say that people talk about it a lot. So you're going to be like... Well, okay. Well, what's what is this adaptive stuff that you guys are so high on? You know, like, uh, okay. So then you could ask the question of like the adaptive significance part of the Tin Virgin's four questions and be like, yeah, okay. Well, you know, you guys are super high on it, but it doesn't seem to me like you're falling into, you know, like based on this tried and true version of things that you know is in your domain of biology or whatever, or you know that kind of thing it doesn't seem to work, you know, or whatever. So that's the only thing I would think is that people seem to emphasize adaptation a lot when it comes to why religion questions. So that's why I was say, you know, and I was just kind of following that basic structure that uh, the David Sloan Wilson guy put out. And I was like, okay, well, we can follow that, you know, cause that seems to be really important to people like Brett Weinstein and Richard Dawkins and David Sloan Wilson. And, you know, like, Oh, it's adaptive, you know, like it, that kind of thing. So I just was like, okay, well, it seems like these then fall into that kind of a category. And now we would move on to another one. So okay. non-adaptive, whether you care or not. Yep. <laughs> the next one I'd say is just the dinosaur hypothesis that really, you know, religion was once adaptive for the conditions it arose in. Maybe it's the big gods thing, big societies. But it hangs around, but is no longer useful anymore. Like, say one could construct an argument for why religion is just a pointless thing to do. Um, you know, one of the things this, you know, like at one time for some religions, eating pork, you know, could be a lethal thing. Um, but today with sanitation and, you know, around animal husbandry practices or medical interventions being more of effective or efficacious or whatever, we don't have to worry about it. So this, the, you know, any kind of like points in our religion that, or even just say the whole thing potentially like religions and you know, they had some purpose they served. Um, but now it's, you know, it, whatever, it's just this thing we do. We don't need to do it anymore. Yep. Um, I was thinking about like the pseudo there's this, you know, type of, you know, DNA, uh, elements that are known as pseudo genes. 
And they're just genes that once had a function but no longer do, produce little nothing. So that kind of thing. So doesn't provide us with any more survival and reproduction, medical science or healthcare research. You know, that does now, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, so there's that one. Uh, and then another non-adaptive one I came up with just because I was reading and stuff and, you know, I can't help it. And I, I call it sort of the blind Matthew hypothesis. Um, the idea is that like, you know, there's the pattern of religions over time is one, this or this, yeah, okay. Pattern of religions over time is one of the quote, quote unquote Matthew effect. Uh, many are called, but few are chosen, or the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Uh, so a few do well for a long while, but most are just most religions are just short lived. Um, so I guess one hypothesis is that you know much of the gains of successful religions are made because of their ubiquity. You know, um, you could also call it like a length by a sampling or something also called the majority effect. Um, and so uh, they're kind of equal, but they're, you know, they're not equal. And um, some have spread to a lot of people and others have done little to increase membership and then soon die. But by virtue of those religions with a larger following, they tend to increase and stay large without trying very hard. Yet a religious memeplex compared to another may not itself necessarily be adaptive. So this could be a, like a thing that's selected but not adapted. So the little example I wanted to give was that um, like a game of sampling with replacement. So from a pile of paper clips, you sample with each hand um, one and you link them together, then you throw them back into the pile and you repeat that process. After a number of turns, there will maybe we, maybe be one or two long chains of paper clips and many short chains or you know like singletons. The reason being that as a chain gets longer, the pile becomes biased towards the chains being sampled more often than single clips or whatever. So even more so, since chains are more likely to be sampled, multiple chains may be sampled and combined, making still longer chains. So, but because it's you know fairly difficult to see one clip from a chain of clips in a pile of paper clips. You know, one is then blind to the variation, um, and the longer biased chains get selected and produce the sort of Matthew effect. So I was thinking, well, what is it of, you know, one religion versus another? I mean, if you think about the, the three big ones, at least, like, that are even related to each other, you got, you know, um, you know, uh, Islam and Judaism and, and Catholicism, you know, like, these are you know, are they, how are they better than another? You know, like they're all huge. They all have a ton of members. Um, you know, are they better than, uh, Mormonism? Are they better than Buddhism or are they better than, you know, what, what is it, you know, that makes these things, you know, so, you know, that are so large in number better than some little, you know, cultish following or whatever. Uh, how are they better adapted, you know, than another? if they're all kind of huge, you know, and when, when are we counting numbers? It, could it be possible that it's just the non-adaptive feature that just continues on without, you know, having any real connection to some selective environment or whatever. Anyway, I was just throwing that one out there because I thought there needs to be more. Would this one be the same as saying, just taking something that's, relatively accurate as far as we can survey on earth and just expanding it to be absolute and saying every child born to a religion has that religion right wherever if you're born to christian parents then you're a christian and if you're born to islamic parents then you're a muslim whatever is right. that basically what you're saying because then if the ones that are already bigger from whatever start date you start watching what the kids do then they'll just continue to be bigger because they have more babies. Right. And they're more ubiquitous. So people have heard of them. I mean, it'd be the same thing with movies. You know, what are the chances that you're going to see some rare movie in a theater if that theater will even carry it versus like Star Wars or something, you know? Yeah. And so how much of what 
a religion has to offer is adaptive and how much of it is just a product of it being a memeplex that is just kind of everywhere. And, and it isn't like, for instance, sometimes I wonder like my own, like quote unquote morality or ethics or whatever. I mean, I was raised Catholic and, you know, I don't know all the little things that were said in my head when I was a kid, you know, uh, or said around me, you know, and what I was exposed to that I just still hold on to, you know, and it, like, I don't know. Like, and so if I then say, well, that's wrong. What, why am I saying that's wrong? You know, am I just saying that's wrong? Cause like we said, like, I just, I learned it, you know, and that was, that was what I was born into or whatever. And so now I carry that with me, even though I don't give a shit about any of that belief and practice and all that, you know, system of memes or whatever. So that's kind of the one thing I think about. There's got to be some component that when you're in the religion doesn't seem to have any, where's the variation, you know, um, that kind of thing. Like, and, uh, other than conformity, you know, it's like a capitulation rather than an adaptation. Um, and then the only other thing I could, I don't know. I mean, I just think even if you're, uh, if you're growing in numbers from outside, you know, you're, you know, the, the ministers are going to the Amazon or whatever, uh, and collecting more followers or members or whatever of their religion, then, um, you know, okay. But uh, are they choosing between, you know, Jewish missionaries and Mormon missionaries and Muslim missionaries and Christian missionaries? Like, are, and do they, if they do choose, if they have a choice, you know, why are they choosing, you know, um, why are they abandoning their culture for another you know, or some subsystem or subculture or whatever. So, um, you know, and what makes people change religions? Are they really, is it adaption, adaptation? You know what I mean? Like, uh, so anyway, that was just an option. I don't even know if it's a good one. I just came up with it and was like, I'll add it. I like it. I think there's some, that's, aspects of that seem to be happening. Yep. So anyway, um, any particular winners or losers of all these ones that, or is it all just kind of flat wash and you're just like, I hate religion. <laughs> I think that they, I want to say they're all winners to me. Like I imagine that this is a super, super complex phenomenon and mm -hmm. it doesn't have any clean unary explanation and that aspects of all the things discussed here probably have played into the history of humanity on earth as we're talking about it tonight relation to the supernatural to some extent it's just viruses that are that work well in our systems it, you know it's useful fictions that was at least useful at a time but then there's the dinosaur thing where well it might have been useful at some time but then ceased being useful but got stuck in a sort of virusy way of course it seems likely that self-awareness and fear of death is probably going to be a boon to meme plexes that talk about afterlifes i definitely think in a I also read it in a sort of Nietzschean way that I think there's a lot to the idea that religions were sort of at one point literally constructed and foisted upon a populace by an elite for the purpose of control so that some of it might, you know, whether it's a useful fiction or not, it's useful or the people who created it thought it would be useful to them as a means of manipulation. I think that probably happened. So you've there provided, I... yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. But you've already, you've now provided two. You've provided the useful idiot hypothesis, and then the murder on the Orient Express hypothesis of religion, <laughs> which is it's all of it, you know. Oh yeah. Well, I'm just kind of going over them all and giving my spin or whatever, saying why I like aspects of all of the things that we talked about, and then definitely there's some amount of paperclip Matthew sampling because. 
if you're either born into it or encounter a popularizer of it or you watch Tim Tebow do his fucking thing and he's your idol and whatever. So ones that are already popular have a huge advantage that they'll probably be continue to be popular. All of this yeah. seems well, a huge probably is happening. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, just a. I, I feel like I I have to say it, but a huge meme in sports is pointing to the sky when you. Oh, I know. You know, it's disgusting. It makes it really hard to enjoy <laughs> watching sports. And uh, if they don't point at the sky, they point at themselves. They're never like all this work in you know with the team <laughs> went into it. <laughs> if anything, should just be like pointing at everybody. You know. Point at like your coach at the- or your mom or something, man. Jeez. Jeez, yeah. Tell me about it. So anyway, there was a potpourri of uh, hypotheses around religion. And we did not at all say, you know, we didn't do the Sam Harris thing. Which is, that should be refreshing in and of itself. Yeah, because who isn't sick of listening to Sam Harris by now? I don't even know, but I'm sure they're out there. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would like to get a beat on that. But uh, um, <clears throat> do you have winners and losers? No, I mean, what's your? You have overall take? What well, you you, got? you know me. I mean, I I have um my aesthetic things. You know, I um. I guess I really like the Watcher one as an origins explanation. I just think that that one has, it, it, it does a little. I mean, part of it's because they've actually used that one. They're trying to do like hypothesis testing with that one. Um, and then I, I don't know. I do like this sort of idea that there's something that happens cognitively. For humans, you know, because chimps have culture potentially, and if they'd had culture, however, you you know, they've got practices or whatever. I don't know if you could say they have beliefs, but they've got things that might fall under the idea of culture. But they don't have a religion necessarily that we can tell. You know, like the, the there's something maybe in our heads that creates this byproduct that sucks. You know, the idea of fearing your own death or whatever. And, uh, you know, having something there to, to, you know, quell that fear or whatever, that just really makes sense to me for some reason. I'm just like, yeah, that, that's, you know, makes that anyway. Um, uh, and then I like a non-adaptive style of, you know, whether it was once adaptive and no longer is, or it, this blind Matthew thing, I, I'm i just piecing things together, you know, um, for that one. And it just, it seems to be like, well, what if shit just happens, you know? And I think that should be part of every theory of everything ever. Shit happens. Sometimes shit just happens. <laughs> That is like the null. Like, or not. (laughs) It's this, or it isn't. And shit just happened, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, anyway, I'm I'm glad we got through this. I was worried because I was like, ah, how are we going to do this? But we did it. It was okay. Yeah. We can do anything. We put our minds to it, and we've got. No one can ever say that we didn't do it because we did it point to kiss your fingers and point to the sky mckenna you pulled it off the rest of your life the rest of your life I'm man nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did it oh, yeah.